All right. Welcome to another episode of the Meat Mafia podcast. We're here with Salazzo as usual, and we're joined by Mark Schatzker, who is the author of The Dorito Effect. And I hope I didn't just butcher your last name, by the way, Mark. No, you, you did a beautiful job. Okay, excellent. Uh, this, this has been this has been a book that has really inspired um, both Salazzo and myself. So we're, we're really excited to have you here. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Uh, yeah, it'll, I'm looking forward to a good chat. This is another incredible connection that we've made off of Twitter. And Mark, I don't know if you've if you've been able to leverage Twitter the same way, but we what Clemens and I say is that Twitter is what LinkedIn should be. It's like you just get direct access to people and you get insight into what the other person is thinking. So like we've been able to connect with amazing people like you. I don't know if you've had similar success, but we're just pumped that we were able to use Twitter for us to build a relationship. No, I'm a I'm a Twitter idiot. I'm on Twitter, but I I just it's like I'm all thumbs with it or something. So it's uh, it's nice to interact with you guys. You have much more of a facility with it than I do. So yeah, yeah, but um, but but as Clemenza mentioned, the Dorito effect was very influential in shaping both of the way that we think about nutrition. Especially the the interesting thing about it is you take this approach of digging into flavor and the way that our taste buds have really been manipulated. And I had never thought about it from that perspective prior to reading the book. So I think just to start the episode, we'd love to just learn a little bit more about your inspiration for writing the book. And, you know, what did you come across that really made you think that this could be something that would should be turned into a book ultimately? Well, it really started with my first book, which is about steak, which we should probably have a whole other conversation about someday. Oh, but yeah. one of the things I noticed about steak was that um, the, the flavor of most, the vast majority of the steak that we eat is just quite bland compared to how steak used to taste. Um, and it's because we've just gotten better at producing a lot more for a lot less. And that's generally the story of agriculture. So after that book, I started to look around and I thought, you know, it's really not just steak. This is the story of so much. Um, and you'd, you'd see sort of inklings of it, that there'd be sort of passionate, you know, ingredient driven chefs that might talk about, you know, heirloom tomatoes or something. But for the most part, the other thing that struck me was how sort of abstract the conversation about nutrition is. Like it all starts from the neck down, that it's about vitamins and protein and carbohydrates. And this process of it going through your mouth is just some sort of weird thing you have to go through before like the important stuff happens. And that just seems so silly because, you know, people buy diet books because they want to stick to a certain diet that let's say it's high protein or low fat or low carb, South Beach, whatever it is. But then within that, the book always says like the 50 most delicious recipes. So we talk in this abstract sense, like we're all nutrition heads, but when it actually comes down to eating, we really want our food to taste good. And then there's this whole thing as though, especially in North America, we have this tortured relationship with pleasure. It's this hangover from the Puritans or something. You know, Jack LaLanne said, if it tastes good, spit it out. I mean, how incredibly depressing, really? Mm -hmm. Like, so, and then you scratch your head and like, well, why, you know, we are the products of evolution why would evolution have crafted a creature that's essentially programmed to destroy itself by eating? It doesn't make sense. So the more I start to scratch at that stuff, I thought there's just a whole lot more going on. There's this story that isn't being told at all. And, and I think I've just scratched the surface. I think there's so much more to this. Well, Mark, one of the things that I, or one of the expressions that you use in your book is nutritional wisdom. And I, I just kept highlighting as I was going through, because I think it's such a great expression. What, what brought you to that concept, nutritional wisdom? It was, uh, it was, it, it, it's a great point. It's, I think it's probably the most important idea in this book. And, and what nutritional wisdom, what that idea is, is that, is that our, our palate, our inclinations, the food we like, the foods we like, our cravings are in touch with our inner needs. So something simple, like if you feel like an orange, maybe that's because maybe you need vitamin C or on some level, your brain knows that oranges are good for you. Um, and a lot of people intuitively think that's true in sort of the world. Like you talk to people at a dinner party, they, they sort of think there's something to that. If you enter the realms of, of human psychology and, and the people who study eating, that idea is considered passe and kind of woo and hilarious. But I found if you step into another part of campus, I, I visited Utah State University and the mm -hmm. behavioral ecology department. They study animals in a totally different way. They study animals within their environment and they study all the, the crazy things animals eat and the crazy things animals are faced with when it comes to eat. And they have a very different view of nutrition. So most of the humans that study our eating, they think basically we just wanna stuff our face with calories. And that sort of makes sense, right? Like there's a lot of obesity, a lot of people are overweight. We love pizza and cheeseburgers and potato chips and ice cream and whipped cream. 
but there's so much it doesn't explain. Like why are wild mushrooms so expensive and so incredibly delicious? Why does to me grass-fed steak taste so much better than grain-fed mediocre feedlot beef? I mean, we enslaved a population of humans to produce cloves on an Indonesian island, cloves, like cloves. That's like this little seed bud thing that's just sort of packed with flavor, has absolutely nothing in the way of the classic nutrients, vitamins, and that may be a tiny smattering, but you're, you're getting nothing from that nutritionally. Um, so it's, it was the, this behavioral, behavioral ecologist I met named Fred Provenza, who, who basically completely spun my mind and made me think of the act of eating in a completely different way. And really what it is, it's an attempt to nourish ourselves. And I think a lot of the people who study humans think we sort of bumble about the world in kind of a dumb way, hoovering in calories. And by eating a lot of different things, we just sort of happen to get the vitamins and minerals we need. And then there's people like Fred who say, no, in fact, our, our palate is incredibly sophisticated, uh, dynamic in ways we don't even fully understand. And that really opened my eyes and, and made me see not just how we've gotten eating screwed up, but how the way we're manipulating food is it's like we're working against ourselves in ways that we don't understand. Mm. Yeah, it seemed to, Mark, I remember something that was really powerful as you were talking about this concept of dilution, whether it's dilution of the chicken that we're eating, dilution of the tomatoes that we're eating, how nature is actually signaling to us that the more flavorful it is naturally, the more nutrient dense the food is. I feel like that was a pretty core tenant in, in the book. Can you expand on that a little bit? Because I thought that was really powerful when I was reading that. Yeah, so I think the, the what the Dorito effect is, you know, people are always like, well, what is the Dorito effect? And what it is, it's essentially what's happened to food. It's, it's what's happened to food through the lens of flavor. And there's two trends. And one of them is dilution of whole foods. So just all the whole foods we grow, the stuff that comes off farms, the plants and the animals are getting blander. Not only are they getting blander, they're losing nutritional density. At the same time, all the processed food, this ultra processed food, the junk food we're not supposed to eat is getting more flavorful. Literally the flavor compounds that are, are being diminished on the farm are showing up in junk food. So that's the Dorito effect. On a very superficial level, it's like, okay, well, that sounds pretty dumb. We're making good food bland and bad food too tasty. Um, but getting inside what's going on is really interesting. So, and you talk about dilution and that's essentially what's happening to the food we grow. Um, I talk about a study it came out, I think, in the oh, a British Nutrition Journal, and it said that it, it looked at modern varieties of produce versus heirloom and said that they're less nutritious. This caught the attention of, I think it was Organic Gardening Magazine. They were harassing the, um, the USDA, asking the, um, uh, you know, basically saying what's going on. And it also caught the attention of a guy named Donald Davis, who was at, was at the Biochemical Institute, I think at the University of Texas, and he, he took a good look at this because he said, you know, it may not be that simple. It might just be that there's a bit more water. He really did some, some really good science looking at the differences. And he found that broadly speaking, when you look at the, you know, the garden crops that we grow, they're losing nutrition, less calcium, less vitamin C, less riboflavin. The reason this is happening is because something called the dilution effect. And this is happening in two ways. The first is through genetics. We have gotten much better at growing more food. Now, on the surface, this is a good thing, right? We have way more mouths to feed. We also have less farmland because, you know, suburbs just keep expanding and everybody wants to live on nice land. Um, but that's come at a price. And we've genetically, we've made the plants more productive. So they're, pu they're putting more of their energy into growth and in, into, into producing, you know, the stuff that we want to eat, essentially. Um, and also it's the way we raise the plants, the pesticides, the fertilizer, they're always getting a lot of water. We're essentially coaxing them into being very productive with things like the pesticides, the herbicides. We're saying, you know, don't worry, we'll take care of, of, the, of the defense stuff. You just focus on growth. So we're growing lots of food, but that food is, in some ways, you could almost say like less food like, like the nutrition is diminishing, but so is the flavor. And this is where things get interesting because. Most of the essential nutrients in food, and let's say like tomatoes or grapes or something, they don't have any flavor. Um, vitamin C, I think, is the only one, and it's a bit sour. So if you look at it from a purely nutritional point of view, you'd say, well, it's just getting a little less sour. But it's the flavor that's also diminishing. And I, I talk about the work of a guy named Harry Klee. Um, he worked for Monsanto. He actually tried to breed a more flavor, not, not genetically modify 
a more flavorful tomato by getting it to ripen longer and it didn't work. And what he realized is that the flavor story of a tomato, there's a lot more going on. And what he found is if you, if you take a patch of California real estate, you know, farmland, it's growing about 10 times as much tomatoes now as it did a hundred years ago. So way, way, way more tomatoes. But every time we select a tomato plant for productivity, so we're saying, okay, you're disease resistant, you've got a nice shelf life, you're producing lots of tomatoes. Every time we don't select flavor, it's like reverse evolutionary pressure. If you don't select a trait, you're going to lose it. And this is pretty much the story of all the fruits and vegetables that we grow. No one's paid for flavor. There's no one knows of like um, a more flavorful carrot. I mean, there's, I, I can tell you the kinds, but when you go to the supermarket, it's sold by the pound. And everyone's like, well, I'm gonna buy the 99 cent ones. Why would I buy the ones that cost a buck 29? So every time we do that as consumers, we're telling farmers, grow this the cheapest way possible. Just give me more, more, more. And over decades of doing that, we've essentially selected flavor. It, it's gone. It's just these plants don't have the ability to produce flavor because those genes have they're, they're just gone to sleep. We've selected against it. We, we lost flavor for the same reason that we humans don't have a tail anymore because of reverse evolutionary pressure. Do you think there's... Oh, go ahead. No, no, you're good, you're good, go. I was gonna say, do you think there's a way to start to reverse the clock on that uh, sort of reverse evolutionary pressure, it, you know, in a, in a way where we can start promoting more biodiversity and more, uh, you know, start filling the, the whole food? Because I, I think the dichotomy between whole foods losing nutrients, and then also us producing a bunch of junk food at the same time. So it, it almost makes the concept of like, what is food, this uh, like ever ending rabbit hole that you're, you're, if you're eating whole foods, that's not even really enough, like you're just scratching the surface, you need to go out and find whole foods that are raised properly that are have those nutrients in it. So is it possible for us to start thinking about food in a way where we can start producing more of these nutrient dense foods? Yeah, absolutely. And what I would say actually is, is a lot of people get very worried about the nutrient density and I'm not actually as worried. The, the worry I have is if a tomato's bland, you're just not gonna eat it. Or if you do eat it, you're gonna put like Miracle Whip on it or ranch dressing. And then like the nutrition is just going totally the wrong direction. If you make that tomato tasty, you're more inclined to eat it. And it may have 20% less this or that, but if you eat the tomato, you'll, you'll get those nutrients. I think the flavor is a much bigger problem because if whole foods are bland, people are just not going to go near them. But here's what's interesting is that there appears to be a connection between the nutrients and the flavor. So I talked about this guy, Harry Klee, and he essentially, when he tried to create this more flavorful tomato from Monsanto and it didn't work, he then went to the University of Florida, joined their horticultural sciences, and essentially devoted the last few decades to figuring out how to make tomatoes flavorful. And he had a key insight. He was invited to a meeting by a company called Syngenta, which is a huge multinational involved in agriculture and all sorts of stuff. And uh, there was a guy there named Steve Goff, who was like essentially employed by them just to be this big brain, this guy who he was like a senior fellow, like he had this interesting title. And he brought Harry Klee in to give a talk about how a tomato makes flavor. And he was talking about um, one Flavor, flavor compound called phenylethanol, which is like a rose scent. It's a, it's a key flavor compound in tomatoes. And he traced it back and he said, Harry was interested in trying to figure out how does a tomato make flavor? Because he thought if I can figure out how the tomato makes flavor, I can start to figure out what genes are involved. I can start to select those genes. So he, he walked this, this process back and he said, it all starts with an amino acid called phenyl, phenylalanine. And Steve Goff goes, wow, that's really interesting because he's like a cellular physiologist. He says, this is a really kind of big, expensive amino acid. It's, it's kind of metabolically valuable. Isn't that interesting that this valuable amino acid would be connected to this flavor compound, which is an important part of the flavor of tomatoes? So the two of them got together and they looked at the most important flavor drivers of tomatoes, these flavor compounds, and they found that they're all synthesized from essential nutrients. So if you look at it that way, you can think of the flavor of a tomato is like a sign telling your brain, there's good stuff in here, come and eat me. And so what that tells you is that if we improve the flavor of a tomato, we're gonna have to get the nutrients right because that's where the flavor comes from. So I think to some degree, these things hold hands. And if you say, how do you do that? It's a great question. I think it's a really important question and it's actually not that hard. You just start to breed for flavor. 
you start to create sensory panels where people taste these things and go, yeah, that tastes good. And in fact, people are already doing this. The problem is turning around this like gigantic aircraft carrier, which is our food system. And, and you know, it's one thing to find at a farmer's market or some, you know, collective near Portland or something. It's another thing to walk into your local supermarket and be able to buy some tomatoes that taste great or, or buy carrots that taste sweet and, and densely of carrots. So we can do it. The question is, will we do it? And how do we do it? Mm -hmm. It's like there's almost no going back after you go to the, your local farmer's market and shake your farmer's hand and ask them about the strawberries or the blueberries or the tomatoes that they're growing. And then you sit down and cook with those ingredients and like the tomato is literally bursting with flavor, right? There's not, you don't even need to add any, anything to it besides salt and pepper. And I think you even said that about chicken too. I think there's that famous Julia Child quote where she said chicken should be so good that all you need is like salt, pepper, olive oil, and you could just saute it very simply. And it's so contrary to how we think about food now, where it's like everything is just so inherently denatured and diluted, right? It's, it's just very interesting where it's like the food is diluted and then the artificial flavoring of this processed food is continuing to increase. So it's like people that would naturally gravitate towards these healthier alternatives are now being pulled to the processed stuff because it tastes so good and the quote unquote healthy stuff is denatured. So it's like incentivizing the wrong system. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's going wrong in, in like every possible way. It's interesting that you bring up chicken because I find chicken recipes really interesting. I love to look at old cookbooks. And if you look at old cookbooks, you'd, you'd honestly think, boy, these people were just unsophisticated idiots because they're just roasting chicken with salt and pepper. And, and it seems as though they must have just lived in this really bland world. But then when you look closely, you're like, well, they actually had curry powder. They had all the spices we have, they had all the herbs we have, they just seem to use them much more sparingly. And I think the reason for that is their food was just much more flavorful. Now, if you compare the way they did fi fried chicken back then, um, they didn't deep fry it, they, they pan, you know, shallow fried it in a pan. What you do, and I, I mean, if you can get your hands on what's called an heirloom fryer, I strongly recommend it. This, this is an heirloom chicken, which is about 12 to 14 weeks old, weighs about two and a half pounds. Nothing like the chicken you buy in a store. And it is just so incredibly delicious. But what they would do is season it with salt and pepper, dredge it in flour, and then sort of um, fry it so the skin gets crispy. Then you pour a little bit of hot water in the pan and put a lid on it and it steams. And then you take the lid off and sort of crisp it up. It never really gets crispy the way of like KFC does. It's, it's, more, it's, it's, it's more kind of gooey, but it's, it's really, really delicious. Well now, I mean, that chicken like changed my life. It was just, it's a profoundly intense, wonderful, happy chicken experience. Mm -hmm. Then you look at these modern recipes that these sort of hipster chefs kind of have to do for chicken. And it's like you brine it for a day in like bay leaf and Dr. Pepper and lemon and rosemary. And it's just endless. And then you deep fry it. And then you, you put a sauce on it and then you blitz it with something. And it's, it's, it's like stoner food. You're like, this isn't chicken anymore. You're just, you're turning into something kind of like, I want to eat it, it's crunchy, but it's kind of gross at the same time. But you have to do that because I think so much of the chicken has just gotten so bland. I think that was one of the really powerful parts of your book is you talk about you and your, I think you and your wife intentionally sourced this chicken from a local farm and you prepared it with that fried method that you talked about. And I think you unintentionally had a bunch of people over for dinner and all of you, like you, the whole group of you couldn't believe how flavorful it was. And they were asking you how you prepared it. And it was just this very simple method that's so contrary to how 99% of fried chicken is made today. Yeah, in fact, it was a couple. It was a friend of my wife's. They were moving to New York the next day. They dropped in to say goodbye. And then it's like, oh, you know, stay for dinner. And so this woman, I, I didn't even know her at all, really. I met her once. She emailed me, I've never, and I've never heard from her back. She just emailed me saying, like, that chicken was freaking insane. What did you do? Um, it really was an amazing meal. And here's the interesting thing, too, because, and I, I talk about this in the Dorito Effect, but it's something I've been thinking a lot more about, is the nature of deliciousness. We use that word, and it means a lot of different things. You know, people will talk about eating Doritos, and that's like, you're just sort of, your hand goes back in the bag. You kind of feel guilty and gross afterwards. Then there's this other experience of delicious where it's like you're emotionally moved by something. And, then, and it's not just the enjoyment of the meal while you're eating it. It's also how you feel afterwards. It's something we don't spend enough time talking about. We just think about this act of eating. But when I think about a great meal, it's often with great friends. And the food is not only good in the moment, it sort of sets you up for this sort of satiated, happy, reflective period after the meal. We never talk about that. And I think that's such a big part of eating. Mark, I'm curious, 
you must have traveled a bunch to to different parts of the world as you've written a bunch about food. What have been some of your better experiences traveling and, and finding some of these food stories? Um, I, I'm always attracted to traditional um, sort of grassroots food. I, I find high-end cooking often misses the boat. Um, it can be impressive. Uh, there's often a lot of theatrics and um, I feel like there's a sense of like people spending a lot of money to be gratified for you just spent a lot of money on this. I love going to their equivalent of a farmer's market or a small town. My favorite thing is just driving through Italy and going to small towns in the middle of nowhere and just going to a restaurant and like saying, you just serve me what you would have. And then like, you know, 15 minutes later, you're weeping because the food is so good. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite countries to eat in are probably Italy and Japan. I've only been to Japan once and I was absolutely blown away. Italy and Japan, I, well, South Korea also to some degree, but Italy and Japan share the, the, this trait of just being kind of obsessed with food. Um, they have mm. a lot of regionalism going on. These regions kind of sort of fight with each other. They all think they have the best food, that their recipe for this is the best. And oh, their, their recipe over there is terrible. Like they add tomatoes. What kind of idiot would add tomatoes? And then they're like, of course we add tomatoes. They don't add tomatoes, they're, they're savages. Um, <laughs> and they have this passion. What is so interesting is, is we tend to think the, the pleasure of eating is our, our undoing. Well, if that were true, in my view, and I, I think it's easy to defend, Italy and Japan have the best food in the world of any two countries, the Western world, Eastern world. They also have the thinnest people. So that's gotta be telling you, we are getting something wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so I find traveling really interesting, but also I, I was doing a story about chocolate for, for Bloomberg magazine in, in uh, Costa Rica. And I remember, you know, I was with the scientists, we traveled, we'd spent the whole day visiting these chocolate farms and we just went to some local restaurant and they had a steak and it was like from some local dairy cow that they killed. And this is not a steak you could, well, maybe you could serve it. It, it, it was a bit more tough, but man, it had just the deepest, most resonant flavor. This was a steak that was like from the village. And I was in among those people eating what they ate. And that to me is a transformative travel experience. I don't want to go to some all you can eat resort where they're flying in the food from some food terminal in like Houston or something. Mm -hmm. I want to eat what the locals are eating. And, um, and, and yeah, it, I, and I also remember too, we'd stop by the side of the road because people would just be selling local fruit. And I was tasting these fruits I'd never, I'd never even heard of. And, and you just put it in your mouth. And you're like, oh my God, like that's insanely delicious. So that to me is like pure happiness. That's just awesome fun. Yeah. Yeah. The reason I asked that question was I actually spent uh, a few months living in Italy and uh, it was during a study abroad course. And I took, I was taking all my business classes back in the U.S. So I took all these liberal arts classes while I was overseas. And one of the classes that I took was Mediterranean food and culture. And I remember the first class the professor puts up on the, on the board, the first slide is what is food? And my host brother who I was living with, when I told him that he did, he was laughing he, like uncontrollably. He was like, what is food? Like you Americans don't even know what food is. Um, and it speaks to their style and their culture around food, which is, they really like they, they um, when they eat a steak with wine, they want it to be grown as close to each other as possible because they believe in that uh, almost like uh, having it like vertically uh, just grown on the same land and, and how that actually benefits the comp complementary tastes. Um, and and that, that really opened my eyes to the, the cultural differences in food when when I took that class and I was living with an Italian family. Um, and, and traveling on the weekends and going to places like what you just said, like going to the countryside to the random shop that uh, or random restaurant that people had recommended locally. And it's like the best food you've ever had for, you know, only a, a handful of euros. So, um, yeah, I think those travel experiences are, are unique and kind of uh, for people who haven't had them, it's it's uh, enriching to be able to go and, and have good quality food for what you know what the locals would deem like a fair price and it's just kind of what they eat normally yeah and it's also it's one of those things that made me think you know there's something we're not getting right because we you, you know we we talk about foods you know scientists talk about foods being hyper palatable and i understand what they're talking about when people are are binge eating doritos or cheeseburgers or something but it doesn't explain those the, the food experience that you're talking about which is not about eating quickly and stuffing yourself it's a it's a more reflective kind of food experience the other thing that's interesting too about it is, you know, that idea about like your, your cow living near the grapes is interesting. It gets to that, that idea of terroir, which is kind of a pretentious word, 
but also a good word that wine lovers use, which is the idea that the land is reflected. And the land is reflected in, in the soil and the rain and the sun, but also the people, the people who have been living there and who've figured out how to make that land express itself. And it's exciting because food from different parts of the world or even different parts of a country or even a county can taste different. And that's exciting because one of the most kind of dismal things about manufactured food is that it all tastes the same. Mm -hmm. um, every bag of Doritos, I'm really obviously beating up on Doritos. It's, it's true of like soft <laughs> drinks, it's true of potato chips, it's true of McDonald's, it's true of Pizza Hut. It all tastes the same all the time. They pride themselves on consistency. And what we should pride ourselves on is consistency of quality, but mm. not consistency of flavor. The, the seasonality, the fact that things can change from valley to valley, that, that's what makes food exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to your point, it's like we've almost, we've lost that sense of connection and nourishment with our food. Like you talk, I think you talk about the concept of, I think you mentioned you, you know, you go to McDonald's and you woof down a cheeseburger and fries and you have the Mick, I think you said you have the Mick regret from it. And I think a lot of people in America can sympathize with that where it almost feels like when you're eating you're having an affair which i know is kind of like it's it's you know there's morality to it but i think a lot of people have that relationship with food whereas in the u.s if you you stumble upon this amazing farm to table restaurant like blue hill at stone barns or harrison and i love this restaurant called Daidue in austin which sources everything from local texas farms and and things like that it's this uh, there's like this incredible connection to the ingredients and the food that you're eating and you feel like it's nourishing you, you're enjoying the meal, you want to savor every single bite. And it seems like that's what these other countries have been able to do really well. And hopefully we can just start this like hyper localized movement where we can crave these things and vote with our dollar and try and bring some of that back to the US. Yeah, you no, know, and it's funny how people talk about the food hangover, like, like they expect it. And it's, it's like this price you got to pay. And it's like, no, it's actually that's wrong. You've eaten the wrong food, your body's not supposed to react to like nourishing food does not make you feel like crap. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's, yeah, it's a lot of people I, I think haven't been exposed to like how good food can be. Um, but I do think there's hope. Like I think, you know, an interesting trend to look at is craft beer. If you, I talk about this a lot, but if you go into a time machine and rounded up a bunch of beer executives in the late 1980s, early 1990s and said in 20 years, 25 years, everyone's going to be drinking like porters and stouts and IPAs. And they're going to be talking about different kinds of hops and stuff. These guys would laugh. They would say the beer that people drink, Miller Lite, Bud Light, Coors Light, it tastes so similar that the, the they, people who drink it can't even tell the difference. It's about marketing. It really was like that. And it completely flipped. And people are spending more money to drink beer that has more flavor and, and is, is reflective of of the passion that goes into it. What kind of beer is it? What were the ingredients? So I think that's a really positive trend, which says, you know, things can go in the right direction. Like we're not doomed. When, when you spoke about um, Italy and Japan, I, I think of those two cultures as very uh, culturally rich too, when it comes to uh, their food cultures, but also just in general, they kind of have like these rituals around food. Is that an important element of this whole conversation about getting back to the roots of eating highly nutritious foods? Yes, absolutely. It's about ritual. It's about celebration. Um, there's this, uh, I talk about this, this festival they have in, in Treviso, which is this town in Northern Italy, oh, yeah. where they, they celebrate radicchio, which is this, we think of as this bitter, like lettuce-like plant, which it is, but they revere it. Now, this is really interesting because we, we can't just be you know, calorie zombies if, if we're eating radicchio, right? But they, they put on crostini and on pizza and, and salads. They do all these wonderful things with it. Um, I, now I can't remember your question. <laughs> I, start talking. I, was, I was just asking about um, the, the- Oh, yeah, yeah, ritual. Yeah. And I think that's a big part of it. And I think, you know, some people talk about mindfulness and I think that has something to do with it. It's this idea of really celebrating food and eating with people is a big part of it. The other mm. weird thing is like, eating in the car or eating in front of the TV. Mm. Like, it's just, yep. don't do it. It's just, you should be enjoying your food. It's just not the right thing to do. And I think they often, I mean, Italians, they look at all these cup holders in their cars and they just think it's like, why don't you just sit down and enjoy your coffee? Yeah. It's, it's, it's such a, it's such a totally different way of coming at it. And listen, I'm guilty. I drink coffee in the car, but I try not to eat in the car unless I'm, you know, like on a road trip and I have to get to the airport or something. Mm -hmm. Right. I think they've done studies on the concept of distraction and the amount of food that you consume. And I think that if you're sitting down to have a meal and watching TV, 
there's some ridiculous percentage more food that you end up consuming while you're distracted eating and watching TV at the same time. No, it's, it's for sure. And, and it's also, I think it's such a nice way to kind of, it's this thing that's constantly cementing human relationships is, is eating together. Mm. It's just a great thing to do. Um, and I don't know how we've gotten so far away from it. It's like we, Harrison, and I talk about this all the time. Some of our best experiences have literally just been going to the local farmer's market, buying a couple steaks, buying some vegetables, making some dessert and having a couple of our friends over and just kind of like sharing in this connected experience. You get a bottle of wine, you have a two, three hour conversation. And it's like, it's incredible how these simple things can make such a connected experience. And it's all through food. So the other thing that you point out is cooking is easier when your ingredients have flavor. So I think a lot of people don't cook. They're like, well, I don't have the time. I think most people actually do have the time. Some people don't, uh, but most people do. I think it's a trade-off and I think they're frustrated because they put a lot of effort in and the the meal sucks. And it's Mm -hmm. like, well, all your ingredients were super bland. That's the problem. The other thing I often push back a lot against too, is everyone says like processed food is so cheap. I don't actually think processed food is cheap. I got three kids. And when I go to the supermarket, the, the, the stuff in my cart that costs the most is the stuff that comes in a package, the crackers, right. bike cookies or something like that. Um, if you, I got three kids. If I go to like a fast, a fast food restaurant, it's like 65 bucks or something. Like it, like it ends up being a lot of money when everyone gets what they want. If I go to the supermarket and buy a meal with that money, we can eat like kings. I mean, you can buy a $30 bottle of wine. You can buy a, then a pork roast and vegetables and potatoes. Like it's amazing how far that can go. Now, there's a lot that goes with that. You have to have the knowledge. You you have to have the desire to do that. But I just think when people are saying like processed food is too cheap, you know, if you find that $1 burger special, it looks that way. But really, if all the food you're buying is pre-prepared, it's not cheap. And one of the things we talk about is we should be thinking about the lifetime value of our food, like connect it with our healthcare bills too, right? Like if you're eating that cheap food, it, it's kind of a an unfair and difficult calculation to make but if you think of it that way it makes you incentivize more to go to the supermarket supermarket take your time cook the food that's going to be more fulfilling and and nutritious for you as opposed to taking the shorter term you know quick quick uh run through the drive-thru so i I think that i like the way of thinking you're absolutely right. I mean, the healthcare costs of, of obesity is in the billions of dollars. So, yeah. so in fact, you do pay a way higher price. You just wait 20 years and, and then you, you actually, you also suffer. Yeah. You feel miserable and you might die. So yeah, it's, it's kind of a no brainer when you look at it that way. Mm-hmm. Mark, one of the really eye-opening chapters in the book is when you peel back the curtain on the time you spent at the McCormick flavor facility. How eye-opening was that for you to spend some time there, knowing that there's such a giant with all the different types of flavors that they create and spices and things like that? It was so interesting. Um, it's a really interesting company. What makes McCormick interesting is that they've got their hands in two different sort of streams of the flavor world. They're a herb and spice company, and they they produce excellent, well, spices um, and dried herbs. And the, the stuff they produce is, is top-notch. Uh, they're really good at it. They're also, on a smaller level, a flavor company. They're not nearly as big as the big flavor houses like International Flavor and Fragrance and Simrise um, and, and the, the big ones. But it's the flavor part of it that's really interesting because the, so you know how I talked about the tomato that, mm-hmm. that Harry Klee and Steve Goff found how the tomato synthesizes flavor from these essential nutrients? There's something like 26 flavor compounds in a tomato that drive liking. Um, what, what what opened the door to all this was a device called the gas chromatograph. The first one became commercially available around the 1950s. And it was really shortly after that that we started to see the birth of the, the flavor industry. So what's, what's interesting to reflect on is before that, scientists had no idea what made food flavorful. We, if it's funny, if you look at like a, a nutrition textbook from back then, we knew an awful lot about the vitamins, the polyunsaturated fatty acids. We, we were really on top of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Flavor was this big mystery because flavor exists in food in just the most minute amounts. You're talking parts per million, parts per billion, sometimes parts per trillion. Mm. So you're looking at an orange or a like a hot dog and you're going like, what is it that this flavor magic comes from? The gas chromatograph is what opened this Pandora's box. Essentially the way it works is it volatilizes these aromatic compounds and puts them through a big coil and where they separate and they all come out the other end. Um, and then you can capture them and analyze them. And then you're like, okay, we know what, what the flavor, let's say one of these key flavors in butter is, well, why don't we put that in margarine? And that's something that happened really soon after 
um, the gas chromatograph was invented. Um, but essentially what these companies do is they figure out how, how to create, let's say, the sensation of orange without using an orange. Mm. Um, and often they'll do it using something what they call natural flavors. So this is a real kind of a bait and switch where people are getting duped because people look at an ingredient panel or whatever and they see natural flavors and they're comforted by that word natural. They don't know what it means. I don't even think they think about it, but they see natural and they think, well, this is healthful and nourishing and the, the, like the goodness of the forest or the orchard. What that means is the only thing the word natural means when it comes to a flavoring is it refers to the process. It means the process by which it was made was quote natural. So it was something like a centrifuge or distillation or using heat. Whereas an artificial flavor will be like a much more manipulated chemical that might you know, start with like a hydrocarbon or something. Mm. The chemical is the same. It's just, how did you make it? But here's the thing. When a company is making like, let's say a strawberry or an orange flavor, they don't want to use strawberries or oranges. Those are way too expensive. You just, just buy strawberry orange. But it's like, oh, but if we can make a soft drink taste like orange and not have to use oranges, then we're winning. So mm -hmm. what they'll say, so a really complex orange flavor will say, let's say 35 or 40 flavor compounds in it. They'll be like, okay, let's just do six. Let's just do eight. That's cheaper. And then they'll create an orange flavor, which is like, we've all tasted like, you know, orange flavored bubble gum or something. It's like, yeah. It tastes like a cartoon version of orange, right? But it's enough, especially for a kid to, you know, you dump in a lot of sugar. Oh, yeah. So what they do is they, they create these knockoffs of flavor. But here's what's also interesting. Remember I talked about how a tomato, that the flavor is a reflection of the nutrients? Mm -hmm. Well, when you create the flavor, they're not also creating the nutrients, right? They're not, mm -hmm. they're not putting in the phenylalanine with the phenylethanol. They're just putting in the phenylethanol. Um, so if you think of a tomato as the flavor is reflective of its nutrition, when you make a tomato flavor and create a ketchup flavored potato chip, you're creating that experience of tomato-ness, which to your brain is, has nutrition attached to it. And guess what? Hmm. There's no nutrition attached to it. So that is what so much of our processed food, like so many scientists right now are scratching their head going, what is it about ultra processed food that makes them so bad? And to me, it's clear. This is food that tastes like something it isn't. Hmm. These flavor houses pride themselves. They talk about how they have these expeditions. They go into the jungle and they find like the purest passion fruit or killer lemon. They, they find all these exotic fruits and they analyze the flavors and they produce them and reproduce them as though like they're so brilliant. I mean, they are brilliant, but it's like, why is it that so many processed foods taste like the jungle, the flavors of the jungle? You look at soft drinks, they're, they're, there's fruits and spices and berries. Why are they knocking off real things that in, rea in, in the real world are nutritious? I mean, there's something really wrong about it. And so much of our food is produced that way. Mm -hmm. We had a really interesting conversation the other day with with uh, a guy named Mike Collins. He, he goes by the Sugar Free Man. I don't know if you know him or not, but he talks about. Um, I think he's the director of food addiction, the Food Addiction Institute in the U.S. I, I might have the the actual name there wrong, but I'm curious how you see that food addiction idea or concept playing into everything that you've written about in the Dorito effect. It seems like it's, it's almost kind of core to the issue, right? Where these natural flavors are really playing into that addiction uh, or, or almost like a, a masked addiction that you don't even really know is happening. Yeah. So I, I look at it this way. There's one reason I don't like addiction um, because people immediately jump to heroin um, and cocaine and those, those, substances are different and that they immediately go right behind the blood brain barrier and start to monkey around with like just you know these neurotransmitters that they're pulling these strings like like a marionette food is different in that um it doesn't it's it's sensed right mm -hmm. um so to me it's more like a behavioral addiction something like gambling um i think the other thing i'm wary of is someone saying like oh man i really love doritos I know what it's like to be a heroin addict. No, you don't. Like heroin addiction is, is absolutely awful. It not only destroys individuals, it destroys families. It's, mm -hmm. it's re but I think what we can say is that these are dysfunctions of the reward system where, where at their worst, people are engaging in a behavior they know to be negative and they don't feel that they have control over themselves. And I think that is a legitimate thing, a legitimate thing they have in common. That's something that like the reward system's there. Like we eat to nourish ourselves if you're eating and you're poisoning yourself and you know it's happening and you can't stop, that's a big problem. And there's something really wrong with that.
Mm. Mark, something we've talked a lot about to your point is the concept of combining salt, sugar, and fat, right? How it's very rare to find combinations of the three in a singular food in nature. Processed food knows this. They're masters at being able to ma manipulate those three combinations. Is that something that you came across a lot in your research as well with the books that you've written? So I'm actually a bit of a skeptic on the salt, sugar, fat thing, and I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, you, you do find people often say, you know, fat and carbs never go together, uh, fat mm -hmm. and sugar. You do, actually, in breast milk, there's fat and sugar, mm -hmm. the, the first thing we ever consume. Um, but I think it's more complex than that because so many of the fine cuisines of the world, you look at Japanese cuisine, you look at French cuisine, they're putting these things together all the time. When you look at people who are trim, I'm trim, I'm lucky, I don't know, I'm lucky enough that I don't have these struggles with food. I'm combining these things all the time. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's more complex. And I, I take the example, let's look at soft drinks. We always say, well, soft drinks are bad because of the sugar, right? And it's this, people say the sugar is addictive and, and it's those sugary drinks. Well, let's just think about that for a second. Because we, on a kind of pure nutritional level, you look, look at that soft drink aisle, not, not the artificially sweetened ones, not the diet stuff, but just the regular ones. On a core level, this is soda water with like nine teaspoons of sugar in it in a can, right? Mm -hmm. Dr. Pepper, Coke, 7-Up, Fanta. That's what they all are. If I served you a can of soda water with nine teaspoons of sugar in it, do you think you'd drink it? Probably not. <laughs> not much. I mean, I gave it to my kids. They're like, this sucks. Like, what's going on? Yeah. It's like, this sucks. It's the flavorings that, that mm. animate them, that bring them to life and make them go, wow, I want to have another sip. Mm. So the flavor plays such a key role. Now, if you flavored that legitimately with like actual like lemon, like when you actually start to put real food, all of a sudden the nutrition is changing. You're probably, you know, that maybe you're getting into like fiber and things like that. It's the flavoring that plays such a big role that I think has been so overlooked because we're, we're such reductionists. We just, we just want to talk about just like the sugar. And it's, to, to me, it's much more complicated. And I think the food companies, like they know it's way more complicated than that. There's a reason these flavor companies are worth billions of dollars. It's because flavor is, is what makes food seem like food. And that is, is such, plays such an important role. If you think about what American families were eating in the 1950s, you know, meatloaf with mashed potatoes and gravy, these are combination of salt, there's carbohydrates, there's fat, they had sugary desserts. I think what's happened to food is more nefarious and deeper, and, it, and it's getting at us at a deeper level than that. Mm. And that's where the Dorito effect is so interesting and had left such a big impression on the both of us because you're not really, you, you, like, like I just mentioned, right? It's very easy to pinpoint salt, sugar, fat. You don't traditionally think about flavor in the manipulation of taste buds as what could potentially be making you quote unquote addicted. That's why your book is so interesting because it really peels back the curtain on that stuff. And that's why the Coke and the sugar water example is so is so spot on because if you gave us a glass of water with nine teaspoons of sugar. We think it's disgusting. Yet if you manipulate the right flavors into that, it's like we can't stop drinking the stuff. Yeah. And well, you know, the best example of all is Doritos. And that's why mm -hmm. I called the book The Dorito Effect. And I'll tell the story because it's such a good one. Um, it started it actually started with this guy. He was a Madison Avenue ad man. You remember that, that uh, TV show, Mad Men? Oh yeah, incredible so show. This guy could have just walked off that show. He worked on Madison Avenue. I think he worked on like the Campbell Soup account and like the Jell-O pudding account. And he got hired by the Frito company to be their VP of sales and marketing. So he moves to Dallas, Texas. Very quickly, they merge with the Lay's chip company and become Frito-Lay. And he takes his kids on a trip to Southern California. At this point, this company is in the business of selling Fritos and like potato chips. I think they had barbecue back then. That was it. He's driving south towards San Diego and they pull into this, like his daughter described it as a little Mexican shack and he tastes a tortilla chip. This guy's name is Arch West and he's like, this is it, I've got it. This is gonna be Frito-Lay's next big thing. So he goes back to Dallas and he, and he pitches this idea and they're like, what are you talking about? Like the tortilla chip's kind of like a Frito, been there, done that, no, wrong. And he's convinced that they're wrong. And he funnels money into this offsite facility to develop this concept. He even comes up with a, a name, which in this highly bastardized Spanish means little pieces of gold, Doritos. And he launches the tortilla chip. He said, gentlemen, I give you Doritos. He gets the green light. They market Doritos. And I'm, you're thinking this is when it all changes, right? They've got us. No, because the first Doritos were just salted tortilla chips. They said like, there's like a little diagram in the bag that said you could put it in dip. It said toasted corn taste, and they bombed. They didn't sell. Mm. And the complaint was, the chip sounds Mexican. It doesn't taste Mexican. 
So this guy, Arch West, has to face his fellow executives. This chip, he, this tortilla chip he wasn't supposed to develop. It's bombing. They're like, what are you going to do? And he says, let's make him taste like taco. And this gets laughs. And one of them says, our Yankee friend from the North doesn't know the difference between a thing and a flavor. And this is so interesting because this is when everything changed. Because that guy was right. Up until that point, different things have flavors. If you want to eat strawberry, get a strawberry. You want to eat cherry, get a cherry. They, they have like really bad imitation fruit flavors and stuff. If you want to eat a hot dog, get a hot dog. Well, this was about seven years after the gas chromatograph appeared. And Arch West knew it's like, not anymore, guys. We can make stuff taste like what we want it to taste like. So Frito-Lay launched taco flavored Doritos. Did wow. they taste exactly like tacos? No, but they had that zing and that depth and that tang. And that is what changed Doritos. And nutritionally, same amount of carbs, same amount of salt, same amount of fat, just as crunchy. But flavor, the flavorings, this dusting of these flavor chemicals turned a tortilla chip that nobody wanted to eat into a tortilla chip that is notorious for you, like cannot stop eating them. And that to me says so much about the power of flavor. I'm curious now what your favorite chapter was to write in the book. We've, we've talked a bit about the Dorito effect, um, but you know, as, uh, as uh, Brett and I have gotten into writing, we found that sometimes writing just comes easily because you love writing about it. Was there a chapter in the book that you just got through quickly because it was so enjoyable to write? No, it's funny. I think the ones I end up liking later are the ones that may have been harder to write. The, the chapter I wrote about Fred Provenza and his initial insight, and I, I guess I got to share this because it was so interesting. Fred grew up in Colorado and he was a ski racer and he loved the outdoors. He would work on ranches and um, he was at grad school. And I don't know exactly know what he thought. He would be do, doing something exciting like, I don't know, with like herds of buffalo in Yellowstone or something. I don't know what he thought, but he found himself doing his PhD project, um, was trying to get um, Angora goats to eat uh, black brush, which was just this like weed that grew in the desert. And the hope was that they could eat this stuff and then these new shoots would grow and then cattle could come and eat them and you'd get your cattle fat and make money. Um, and at the time, in, in his department, the, like the, the big heavyweight professors thought that these goats are dumb. They kind of come out of the womb when they're born. They just sort of have this fuzzy idea of what they want to eat. And they bumble through the world eating what they want to eat. They don't possess any nutritional wisdom. And so Fred was, at one point, he knew that the, the new tender shoots of black brush were more nutritious. They were softer, easier, you know, easier to chew, and more nutrients in them. And he found that these goats wouldn't eat them. And he couldn't figure out why. And his professor said, that just goes to show you, goats are dumb. They don't have any nutritional wisdom. But Fred thought, no, there's something more to it. And he thought, maybe there's some kind of a compound in there that the goats don't like. He said, it makes sense. Because if you're like a black brush plant, you're trying to you know, produce this new shoot, you don't want to get eaten by a goat. So he separated out all the chemicals in this black brush. And he would spray this feed and feed it to goats back at the lab, like back at the university. And they kept eating it and nothing happened, nothing happened. Finally, he's down to his last chemical. He gives it to the goats, they eat it all up. And he's like, oh my God, it didn't work. I'm an idiot. Everything's, you know, goats, goats don't have nutritional wisdom. I don't have wisdom. But for some reason he said, let's just do it once more. And the next day he sprayed this chemical on and he gave the feed to the goats and they wouldn't touch it. And that's when the penny dropped and he goes, they had to learn it. The first day they ate it, they thought it was okay. And they had some long, dark night where they felt wretched. And the next day they took a sniff and they're like, I am not going near there. And mm. that changed Fred's life. And, and Fred's body of research is so fascinating because he, he did this incredible work showing just how intelligent animals are. Um, he showed me there's bitter brush and there's sagebrush. And there's this war going on between plants and plants are using deer as their henchmen to fight this war. So bitter brush is a little bit toxic. A deer can eat some bitter brush. Sagebrush is like, don't go near sagebrush. That stuff will make you feel awful. He once, he once gave a, a sheep too much sagebrush and it had a freaking seizure. Well, there's something really interesting is this, um, this compound in bitter brush binds to the bitter compound, toxic compounds in sagebrush and neutralizes it. So bitter brush is fighting a war in sagebrush by saying, come eat me, then you can go eat my enemy sagebrush. And somehow these deer, these sheep, these ruminants have this ability to learn 
that if I eat this, I can wander over here and eat that and I'll be okay. So they eat in courses. Their eating starts to become like they're having a meal. I'm going to have some of this, then I'm going to have some of that. He found that if he made sheep deficient in phosphorus, he would give them a feed with a flavor that sheep would never come across, like coconut. And he'd, he'd give them this coconut flavored feed and then he'd put this kind of burst of phosphorus in their gut, like he put a tube down their throat. And he'd set up this association between the flavor of coconut and the nutritional infusion of phosphorus. And they start to learn. So when later on he would make them deficient again in phosphorus, they go looking for coconut flavor. That's why flavor is so important. It's like our nutritional map of the world. When we were living in the jungle and, and, and living in trees and so forth, we didn't know what vitamins were. We didn't have any rational idea of what nourishment was, even before we had language. So you ask this question, how did we feed ourselves? How did animals feed themselves? Through flavor feedback. Flavor is the chemical language of food, and that's how the brain nourishes itself. And the fact that we're mucking around with this and not asking questions, to me, it's unbelievable. And to me, it explains so much of, of what makes real food not only so delicious to eat, but so good for you, but it also explains so much about why processed food with all these flavor compounds are, are just so bad. Because not only does it make it tasty, it's telling your brain there's nutrients here that just aren't there. Mm. It's funny. I think about all your, that story makes me think of all of our senses as survival senses, right? They're, they all play a role in our ability to survive and sight and smell and taste all probably are, are leading us to the foods that we should be eating, right? Or shouldn't be eating if we were trying to survive out in the wild. Right. And if food was telling the truth, Right. If, if, if food wasn't engineered to tell lies, it's, it's I mean, it worked remarkably well. I mean, this problem we have with um, with eating too much is really quite recent. It's only a few decades old. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, uh, you know, to me, it, it's, it's not a coincidence that you really start to see it take off shortly after the birth of the flavor industry, which which made all this ultra processed food so much more compelling to eat. Would, would we eat any of the stuff without the flavors? I don't think we would. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mark, just curious what. um. What dietary approaches have worked best for you? Do you get into like the low carb, ketogenic, plant-based rabbit hole? Or are you more so just focused on, hey, just source really good quality food from your farmer and that's all you're really concerned about? I'm more in the latter camp. I don't have an issue. I, I mean, I think we eat um, like, like something like carbohydrates. Do we eat too much carbs? I think a lot of people do, but I think I, I, I would ask the question, why? And mm -hmm. when you look at how we process them with the flavors, that it, it's like we're trying to understand the behavior. I think if you eat real food, you know, let your palate be your guide, and I think it'll do a good job. Um, I like. I remember my early twenties. I could just eat steak every night, and I loved it, and it did me no wrong. Uh, my mm -hmm. taste buds have changed. My my palate has changed. I still love steak. I still eat it regularly, but not every night. Um, and I think uh, I, I've got kids and kids have very different palates. There's no way, you know, something I'd serve at a dinner party, I wouldn't serve to a three-year-old. There's no way they'd hate it. And I think I wouldn't agree with them, right? So I, I think our brains are much smarter than we give them credit for if you give them food that like, if you give them real food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mark, I would also say though, everyone's got to figure out what, what works for them. Some people, if, if like keto works for you, then, you know, I'm not going to say don't do it, but yeah. um, I know it works for me. Yeah, we, I think we share that, that similar philosophy. It's like you, you need to have an individualized approach to it. And ultimately, if you get to the point where you're eating more real foods, that's, or all real foods, that's kind of the, the winning formula. Uh, so, so Mark, I'm curious, is there anything you're looking at now in terms of research or, or studies that are, you know, captivating your attention in terms of things that you're thinking through now? Um. I think what I'm thinking of more than ever is um, what I start to think about with the Dorito effect is how the way we talk about food is so divorced from the experience of food that we are obsessed with nutrients. And I keep coming back to that, that um, we're so divorced from the experience of eating. We think there's something so dangerous and, and we're such, you know, like we're all wearing white lab coats and talking about food on such an abstract level. And I think the experience of it is so important. And it's like, we, we need to relearn how to eat on an intuitive level. Um, you know, I, I could talk about Italy endlessly, but I find they're, they're so much more connected to food 
that their food festivals are about what they grow in this patch of earth. And I wish we did more of that because it's just, it's just a much better and more enjoyable way to eat. Mark, are there any, are there any books or just pieces of content that you came across earlier in your career that really shaped the way you started to think about nutrition and just question the conventional narrative that we've been taught within Western society? You know, one of the books that had a big effect on me is a book called All Manner of Food by a guy named Stephen Mennell, who's, I think he's at Trinity College in, in um, Dublin. Mm -hmm. And that really is about the history of European food. It really doesn't have, so I guess that was a really early glimpse of what I call like Dorito cooking. Um, it's funny, if you think about medieval food, have you ever been to one of those medieval dinners? Yes. Um, yeah, <laughs> like everyone goes once, right? Um, and they serve yeah. kind of like, almost like barbaric food, like crudely roasted meat and stuff like that. Medieval cuisine was nothing like that. Medieval cuisine was actually much more like Indian cuisine. It was mm. a cuisine of mixture. So when um, medieval um, you know, nobility would put on these feasts, um, they were very elaborate. And, and the idea was to mix flavors as much as possible so that you didn't really know what you were eating. So it'd be kind of like eating like intense curries or Chinese food. You know, sometimes you say with Chinese food, like it could be chicken, it could be beef because you're really tasting the sauce. Um, so it was called what's called a cuisine of mixture. Um, and they would do all these elaborate things like they cook a peacock and then put it back inside its feathers and serve it. I, I think the food poisoning must've been off the chart, but um, so it was very elaborate, very festive, but very different in terms of its character, a cuisine of mixture that it then sort of turned this corner and became a cuisine of essential flavor where instead of trying to disguise the food that we eat, it was about celebrating and amplifying its essential goodness. And that's what I think of as being really truly great Italian or French cuisine when it's, when it's on. So that was how I kind of got interested in food from an aesthetic point of view. And then later on, it started to marry up with nutrition when I started to think that, oh, this essential flavor isn't just about sort of this kind of way of eating. It's actually telling you something profoundly important. So when we're kind of getting away from foods that really have their own flavor and starting to now like absolutely bombard them and turning and going back to this more what I think of as kind of primitive cuisine of mixture where you're just bombarding your food and flavoring to sort of make it palatable that's that's sort of turning back the clock so yeah, so that book had a big effect on me and it's a book like nobody's read but I love that book it's called all manner of food all manner of food yeah that's really interesting because that makes me think a lot about just this concept of I feel like we overcomplicate cooking. Like there's so many people that talk to, to Harry and I that say, oh, you know, I have no idea how to do anything in the kitchen. I, I don't even know where to start. And we always just say, it's like, if you just source really good quality ingredients, really good spices, there's only a handful of dishes that you really need, or at least that I use, because I could just keep going back to these dishes, like a really well seared steak with some smashed potatoes and like well-prepared vegetables. It's like, as long as you have those baseline ingredients mastered, the food should be able to take care of itself. It's like, you can, you can dress it up as much as possible, but if those core ingredients aren't good, it's like, you're just kind of, you know, you're not really going to get anywhere. I, I totally agree. I also think like a shoulder cut from a pig, a lamb mm -hmm. or a cow, like you can cook it forever. It just gets more tender. Like, <laughs> like, I mean, you overcook a steak and it's like a grievous sin, you know, you've got to do penance, but wow. Okay. So my, my pork shoulder turned into pulled pork. That's a good thing, right? Yeah. Um, and you can play with the flavors. You can do Italian flavors one day and you can do Mexican flavors. Um, it's, it's not only easy, it's fun. And mm. you also get a lot of credit for it. I always tell this to guys, learn how to cook. Like you get so much credit. You don't have to do the laundry. People are like, you did a great job. There's glory in it. It's creative. It's fun. It's, it's like, it's such a great thing. Yeah. And you're like, it took me 10 minutes to make the steak. And then I just dressed the potatoes really well, put them on a pan and baked them for 45 minutes. And they think that you're an absolute genius. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's great. Exactly. You have a beer, you know, like watch the baseball game while you're making dinner. Nothing could be better. Yeah. We might not be able to publish this podcast after that. Cause that's, that's been our secret that yeah. the secret's out now. Exactly. Yeah. Don't make them know it's easy. Cause then you have to say like, oh, it took me four hours. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that's classic. Mark, what's the best way for people to find you and just connect with you online? I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm, I'm rarely on Facebook at Mark Schatzker. Um, MarkShatzker.com is my website, which is really poorly populated with information. I think the best thing is to read my books if you want. And if you want to read, um, you know, what I'm all about. Um, and yeah, but I'm on, I'm on social media. If people want to reach out. Awesome. Mark, have you ever done a Twitter spaces by any chance? 
I don't even know what that means. Oh man. So we'll have to, uh, we'll have to show you what it is, but it's basically just this type of forum, but you, you get on and it's live in front of a, a Twitter audience. So people can just come. It's like you have a room uh, as if you were presenting at some sort of, um, you know, book signing and people can just come in and, and listen to what, you know, us three talk about the Dorito effect or whatever book. So it, it's kind of a cool forum. We've been testing it out a little bit, but I think, uh, I think your uh, information and knowledge base would do really, really well on one. Yeah, no, that'd be fun. I did a clubhouse once. Is it kind of like that? It's, it's or, Twitter's version of clubhouse. That's exactly yeah. what it is. Okay. Yeah. So we could drive a bunch of our followers to it and we could talk through the Dorito effect or the end of craving or any interesting topics that you wanted to talk. Yeah, that sounds like fun. I'd be into it for sure. Awesome. And, and obviously what goes without saying, we both just ordered two copies of the end of craving on Amazon. So we're both really excited to dig into that. It doesn't look like it's too thick. So we want to try and read that and have you back on to discuss that as soon as we can, because this is- I can't wait to hear what you guys think of it. That would be my pleasure. So let's do that for sure. Well, yep. The book's not too thick, but both of us are pretty thick. So we <laughs> months to get through. Clemenza, is Twitter going to be able to handle when Mark starts writing threads too? No. <laughs> yeah. We're going to be out of business. Yeah, yeah maybe like 150 uh, <laughs> tweets long. That's my problem. I can't- <laughs> Oh, it's been awesome. It. Uh, Mark, thanks a lot. Really appreciate you coming on and, and we'll do it again. Thanks for having me, guys. Lots of fun. Thanks so much.